All righty. Here is the second game, me versus Jason, at the November 2013 monthly Manhattan Netrunner Tournament at the Complete Strategist, right under the Empire State Building. Store's been there forever. If you need a game and you're in New York City, 100% guarantee they have that game that you want, especially if it's Netrunner. They'll even call you on the phone and tell you when the next data pack comes out so you can go on your lunch break, take the subway, pick it up. Just in time for the meetup. Okay, there's Jason on the left. He is playing Ye Old Standard Andromeda, which is crazy strong. That's why everybody plays it. That's me on the right playing Replicating Perfection, the best identity in the universe. Believe it or not, four people at this tournament were playing Replicating Perfection. Oh, yeah. Replicating Perfection is really sweet. Totally sweet. <laughs> well, we'll find out. Check out how sweet it is. Nine cards. Ridiculous. I always like to make the joke, you're drawing nine cards, you don't put bad cards in your deck. So how can you possibly ever mulligan, right? You're always going to draw nine good cards. So why would you not keep that hand? Andromeda should just never mulligan. It's like five. Well, yeah, you might get five good cards because you don't put bad cards in your deck, but there might be, you know, a good card that you particularly want at the beginning that's not in there. But if you draw nine, you're basically going to see every good card. Right? There's so many out of 45. So <laughs> there's a one in five chance of drawing any particular card. And if there's three copies of it, which there should be for a good card, you're going to draw it. <laughs> It's just going to happen. Okay. Let the games begin. Install, install hedge fund. The best possible opening. Wayland or not. Upon rewatching this game, it actually... Uh, Spoilers, yeah, I watched it again before doing the commentary. Uh, it was actually, this game is way more interesting than I remember it being. Um, I remember it being a boring one, but actually there is a lot to learn from this game. So pay attention, kids. Pay attention. I'll teach you many things about how to suck and not suck at Netrunner. So Desperado turn one, can't lose with that. Katie Jones... Phil Katie Jones. Whoa, filling Katie Jones in turn one as Andromeda is really not good. That He must have drawn like no easy mark, no sure gambles. Uh, really bad draw for him on the starting turn. You really want to get four cards that you can play. That way you don't have to throw out anything because all your starting cards are good. Because all your cards are good. But I guess he's got to throw something out. And especially, he didn't make anything that makes him money. All right, so look at that. He takes a credit with the last click, throws away a hostage. I guess he doesn't need the hostage because he has Katie Jones on the table already and something else. I probably should have checked to see what that was. Look at this. I have a great start here as replicating. I was able to ice up all the centrals, which is important because it forces the runner to bounce off an ice to hit a remote. And I drop a card in a remote. So he runs R&D. There's an enigma. He loses a click. All right. Uh, he runs the remote, and he gets my melange. That was a key moment in the game. Even though he lost a click from the Enigma, he had exactly one left, and he was daring enough to run that remote, uh, and he got rid of that melange. If he would have let me melange, oof, this game would have been flipped over on its head. I would have been so rich. Okay, he's throwing an extra Desperado, so he's not drawing really useful cards. And he's only got one credit, but Katie Jones, so... Okay, so I'm going to keep the pressure up here. Make him bounce off my ice while he has, if he wants to hit my remotes. Uh, so I drop something else in the remote and I take money. All right, it's like, yeah, you want to hit this remote? you got to bounce off one of these ice. He goes to the account siphon and neural katana. So this is good and bad. On the good, I hit with the neural katana. Pew, 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 pew. I hit, yeah, I hit some good cards there with my neural katana. That was good. On the bad part, his account siphon goes right through. Uh, and here's another mistake I made, right? Uh, I had five credits, and here he's taking ten and removing the two tags. That card that I installed on the table was a private contract. I could have, if I was thinking clearly, which apparently I never do when I'm in a tournament, 
spent three of the credits to res the private contracts. And I think he was actually expecting that. That's why he sort of delayed before just taking ten. Um, so yeah, and then he would have had to decide, you know, is he going to jack out and not successfully run? Is he going to access HQ? Or is he going to count siphon two credits that are left? Uh, and there's no way he would have been able to trash the private contracts. And next turn I would have taken six instead of taking three. So big mistake for me. Here I go. Res the government co oh, private contract. Sorry, private contract. Always get them mixed up. Right? I res it for three, and I take, use it three times, so I net three credits. It's basically the same as clicking for three credits on your turn, but now there are eight left on there. So next turn will be, if I really dump credits out of it, it'll be almost a melange worth. Uh, but I can do other things on my turn, which is, you know, why it's a little bit better. Melange just takes your whole turn. So he drops a corroder. Which I don't think he's going to need. <laughs> Not too many barriers in a Replicating Perfection deck. Alright, you want ice that does something in a Replicating Perfection deck. I guess you'll see a Wall of Thorns. Uh, a Crypsis, that's really strong. Uh, but he's got to watch out for Swordsman. Right? I believe the Swordsman, if I remember correctly, is on the Archives. <laughs> I don't know if he knows that. Um, but the, I always love to put Program Trashing cards on Archives. Because... There is no reason to run archives, usually, unless they have a program, like a sneak door or a data sucker. I guess Jackson Howard changes things a little. You might want to run archives to force them to use Jackson Howard, or just to look at the things that are in there after an ABT. But most of the time, a run on archives is because of a program. So program trashers on the archives are good cards. Okay, so now he's letting me have the private contracts because it's too expensive to trash. I take all the monies from it. He's got all kinds of monies too from his Ketty Jones. Ketty Ketty. And account siphon. Oh, see, if I would have had that Enigma uh, on there, right? I sure wouldn't. I wouldn't have stopped that account siphon with the Crypsis, but I would have stopped the. Uh, first account siphon with the enigma right and on that turn with the melange when he bounced off r&d he would have taken three net damage from the katana then he wouldn't have dared run that melange right because uh, it could have been a snare and he could have died so he would have just drawn for the rest of the turn um he might not have even accessed r&d out of fear at that moment and then he could have melanged so the whole get the whole beginning of the game here really is about me getting account siphoned, losing all my monies. Was that another card I could have rezzed? No, I don't think so. I think that might be a Jackson Howard or something. Um, I'm not sure what that is. Uh, yeah, if I would have just swapped those two ice, Enigma and Neural Katana, which I should have, right? You need an end the run to stop the account siphon. Um, then this whole game would have been upside down uh, at this moment. Right? Ice placement is huge. It is huge. That's what I think about the most when I'm playing Corp. Even now, I'm still trying to get it right. Okay, so I need money. I scored a clone retirement by this point. It didn't really help me. And he's got a data sucker. Sucker! And he's filling Katie Jones. And he's got a Crypsis. <laughs> So really, uh, he's got all the monies. He's got a Crypsis and Data Sucker and a Desperado. So what am I supposed to do? <laughs> it's not good. So I got to put the pressure on, right? I got to I got to set it up so it's like, yeah, here comes trouble. You know, I'm gonna make him be inefficient. I have to utilize my ability. If I don't get him to run remotes, force him to run remotes. I had to punish him for not running the remotes. That way, it's either, look, if you run these remotes, you're going to be really inefficient spending all your extra clicks and credits bouncing off of the centrals. And if you don't run the remotes and just try to hit the centrals only, thus maintaining your efficiency and not letting me use my ability, I will put things in these remotes that will punish you. Of course, the thing that really defeats that, of course, is the Count Siphon, which, you know, makes it, uh, you know, concentrating on centrals only oh so much more uh, effective. 
right, than just running them straight up. Okay, hanging out. Gonna advance once and take two. See, I gotta advance that, you know, you advance something to just two. You know, a good runner knows that at worst, it's Junebug for four damage, right? Nothing else will really ruin your day. Maybe a secretary. Ooh, secretary in this deck. Ooh. Right? So you got to get it up to three, so it's a kill shot at least. And then you got to get it up to four to make it look like a Ronin. Now, he, so he doesn't know if it's Ronin or Junebug. And you just advance things to four, whether they're Fetals or Junebugs or whatever they are. Just advance them to four. And... So that's what really puts pressure on the runner to do something about it. So here's where I really get screwed. He runs HQ, and he plays a double shutdown. So not only did I lose all my money from those account siphons, but now I've lost my investment uh, in those ice. And I don't really have enough money to res them again. So the new card that I installed last turn, I advance... I am trying to really pressure him by advancing these things. Like, yeah, you have to run these remotes. Yeah, I'm advancing them. You have to do something because eventually the double Ronin will become a possibility. And double Ronin is one of my win conditions. <laughs> so, uh-oh, he dropped a Mimic. That's it. Game over. Right? Mimic is so strong because basically... All the worthwhile ice in Netrunner, period, in my opinion, are all these sentries. The ones that have subroutines that do something you like, right? Caduceus, that has subroutines that do something you like. Neural Katana, good subroutines, right? All the ice, Roto Turret, that have really good subroutines and don't cost some ridiculous amount of money or resources to res uh, are sentries that are low in strength and Mimic just chops them down, right? Okay, so I replaced that Katana with the Viper. Forgetting he had a data sucker token and a Yogg, right? I thought, aha, Viper is in this deck because it's one influence. It's bigger than Yogg. So it forces, right? So at least he isn't able to mount many data sucker tokens um, on HQ runs, right? He's, he's just going to break even. And if at some point I clear, uh, he's going to have to encounter my Viper somehow. Okay. I'm curious why he doesn't run my unadvanced card when I have one credit, because if it was a snare, I couldn't set it off. Even now, I have three credits. If that's a snare, I can't set it off. So he should run, if I was him, I'd run the Viper, which he just did, and then run the unadvanced remotes, uh, completely confident that they can't do anything because I have don't have four credits to snare. Uh, there he goes. He runs. It's a private contract, and since he has so much freaking money, he trashes it before I can even use it. Usually you wait for someone to use that, then you trash it. Um, right? It's the same thing with a pad campaign or an Adonis campaign or whatever. Um, oh, so here he's trying to dirty laundry. This is this is an important rule for everyone to know, right? He, he, Jason's a really good player, but apparently he was confused about this rule. When you run, you get past the last ice. At that moment, the runner makes a decision. He has passed the last ice. Either jack out or continue. If you jack out, right, then the run is unsuccessful. If you continue, the run is then declared successful. That's your last chance to jack out. If you're going to keep going at that moment, you must access, right? You can't not access. Uh, you can't be like, oh, I'm successful, but I don't access. No, no. If you are successfully run a remote, you access every card in the remote, no matter what. You just choose the order in which you're going to access them. On R&D, you, if you are successful, you must access all cards in the roots, all the upgrades, right? And the, at least the top card of R&D. And maybe what R&D interface forces you to, right? So on. When you access archives, it's only successful if you, you know, say you don't jack out after that last ice and access, or you must access. That was your last chance to jack out. Uh, so he thought he could, like, dirty laundry, count it as successful, and not access. And it's like, no, if it's successful, you must access. Um, so, yeah. I think there's some other confusion on that rule. Again, uh, throws away a corroder. I've advanced my stuff up. Yeah, while I was talking, I guess he missed some action. 
Not really. Just sort of advancing my cards and taking money. He's got a huge Katie Jones and a pile of money anyway. Okay, so here's some other confusion, is that he wants to run HQ, right? And he doesn't want to access HQ. Well, it's like, well, then you can't get your Desperado credit, right? Uh, actually, we messed up here as well, because if he runs HQ and just jacks out, he doesn't get his de data sucker. To he's not supposed to have a data sucker virus counter right now, right? So here he ruins my game with a satellite uplink and looks at my Junebug and Ronin. Uh, then he runs my Ronin and trashes it, right? Uh, he did make a run on HQ, even though it wasn't successful, and that made it legal for him to run that Ronin. But uh, he should not have a data sucker token right now because his HQ run was uh, unsuccessful. And he did use the one he had, plus his Yogg, to break the Viper and then jack out. So, um, yes, you know, you can't get a successful run. When you get successful run means you got there and you said, I am not jacking out, which means you're accessing. Okay, he trashed my Ronin. He knows the other one's a Junebug. So I'm going to stall in advance something new. He's going to run R&D, and here I'm really stupid. I res an Enigma when there's a Yogg on the table. Don't! Don't! That was a waste of three credits. What the hell's wrong with me? What is wrong with me? I am stupid. He trashes my pad campaign. I am a dum-dum. I'm like, yeah, I, gotta, I can afford it. Not thinking too hard. Should have thought a lot harder about that. There you see an archer, and I do have a clone retirement. But I bet he's probably got a fairy in a... Sh right? He already used two shutdowns, though. So maybe he's probably got a third one. Right? So I'm worried about the fairy shutdown. He ran that remote bravely. Uh, I thought it was Junebug. It wasn't. It was Brain Trust. He gets two points. And no damage, because I'm replicating perfection. Okay. Well, I shouldn't have resed that Enigma. <laughs> That was stupid. And see, it didn't really matter here that he got that extra data sucker counter from uh, running HQ because now he's got a pile of them from running R&D. He steals a fetal, but I do some damage. Notice I only did two damage because I'm not personal evolution. He paid his two credits to steal it. So now the score is four to one. <laughs> it's a bad score for me. Especially when I basically have no worthwhile ice <laughs> resed at all. I have no money. Okay, so I drop an ice. I put something behind it. I think that's the archer there. But I'm not going to res it. Remember, resing an archer costs you a whole point, which takes you far away from winning. So don't res an archer unless it's going to work. <laughs> right? If you're not going to trash programs, or at least end a really important run, don't res your archer. <laughs> I mean, there are other maybe there are other reasons to res it, right? Like maybe you're Wayland, you res it, they deal with it, and it didn't hit. But they spent so much money dealing with it that you can now sea source them, scorch, scorch, right? That's a reason to res an archer. But don't res it unless there's going to be some benefit to doing so. If it's just going to, right, in this situation, he's already played two shutdowns. I assume he's got a third one. Uh, so, and he can walk right into HQ. So I'm not going to res an archer just to have it shut down. Right, he's running my remote. It's the June bug. Right? There's the other shutdown. Okay. So three shutdowns gone. He spends the rest of his turn drawing his cards back up. So how did I fool him with that June bug? I didn't really fool him. It's just what I do is I install cards in the order in which I draw them. That way there's no psychology to it, right? It's like I drew June bug, then I drew the Ronin. Then I drew the Brain Trust, right? It's like the order in which I draw the cards is the order in which I install and advance them. That way, no one can, the runner can't try to figure you out, right? He can't be like, oh, uh, I can get through that now, so he wouldn't put an agenda in an unsafe place, therefore it's a trap, or anything. There's no 
psychology to it. It's the order of the draw. Now, if you have an R&D lock and they see everything you're drawing, well, first of all, uh, I cleared virus counters, by the way, um, just to make it a little bit more annoying for him to hit uh, HQ. And now he has to pay two credits to hit R&D. So it's going to drain him a little bit each time, right? And that's that's really all I need is I, I just need something to slow him down a little bit. Um, you know, to where he's not getting in for free constantly. He's got to pay something. Right? Just, a, just a tax. Some kind of tax so I can catch up. I wish it was an Ichi, but <laughs> beggars can't be choosers. Right, so yeah, if they have an R&D lock, you're not going to be drawing anything that you can advance, right? They're going to trash everything, like ju traps, uh, in R&D, and they're going to steal all the agendas. So, you know, if you're drawing things that can be installed, then the runner does not know what they are. Therefore, install and advance them in the order in which you drew them to eliminate any sort of mind games. Okay, hit my snare, yes! Alright, we're getting snares now. Because I actually had four credits. His stack is running a little low there. That is that is nice. Um, there's actually a possibility here. All right, if he hits another fetal and another snare, things will get really interesting. Unless he has a levy. But if he had a levy, and I, if I was him, that levy could get damaged any moment. Uh, another snare, but I didn't have the credits. Uh, such a shame. Such a shame. If I would have had one more credit there, which I would have had I not res that enigma earlier. Had I, re you know, res the private contracts off the account siphon. Had I done any of those things, then those two mistakes pretty much just cost me a huge snare right there in terms of monies so yeah, just those tiny mistakes can be huge 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 okay. he's basically checking R&D every turn drawing his cards up so he doesn't die and getting his money from Katie Jones to pay for his roto turret breakages See, now that I, I should have noticed, right, that the, well, I guess it was too late, that once the other shutdown went in the trash, yeah, here we go, more ice on R&D, so, make it a little bit annoying. Uh-oh, two R&D interfaces, not the good, not the good, not good. He's going to dig deep. So he runs R&D again. I got a new ice there. No, he doesn't run R. Oh, he is running R&D. But oh, he emptied Katie then ran R&D. And what I'm doing in response to his R&D run is I'm using that Jackson Howard that's been sitting there all game in order to put the snares back in, right, to R&D. Because his stack is so low, if I can just hit with a snare or two, that could be it. See, even though he didn't really run a lot of remotes, just the tax of replicating perfection drags the game out. Dra you know, and even though he's got this full rig of deadly deadliness that can't be defeated, <laughs> uh, he's got four points. I only have one. That's a shame, but he is he is really running low there. And look at that. I put the snares back in, and a snare came out. He sees pad campaign, trashes it, and, oh, government contracts. No, a private, I mean, a friggin' priority wreck. No, that's game. No. Oh, man, I almost had it. 